to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Welcome to the book club. I'm Minnie Menon. You can't talk about theater in India without coming across two famous names, or may I say surnames, uh, the Padamsis and the Alkazis. Uh, so today it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, uh, onto our book club, Fazil Alkazi, who's just written this fabulous book uh, called Enter Stage Right, which is a family memoir combining these two strains or these two great uh, movements in theater, so to say. Uh, Faisal, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to see, to read this book also because it kind of gives you a ringside view into a very formative period of Indian theater. And uh, I think in theater is such a powerful tool uh, to gauge what a society feels strongly about and also as a shaper of society. So I'm very curious, uh, to understand from you and the work that you have done and the kind of uh, uh, stage that you have witnessed uh, as a member of the Alkazi and Padamsi family to actually bring all of these trains together and help us understand uh, uh, how theater has played out in India. I'm going to start with the horseshoe table that you start off with <laughs> in Kulsum Terraces. I think, you know, I, I remember talking to Alec about it and he used to regale us with stories from that period. Uh, but it was a very... Uh, heady time, you know, uh, when so much was changing. So I want to ask you to rewind from there and tell us sure. about what brought all of these people together. Sure. Well, you know, uh, I think in the 30s and 40s, if you look at the history of Bombay, it was that whole reclamation of uh, Marine Drive and what we know to do today as Chopati, uh, just being reclaimed from the sea and quite completely being built at the same time. Hence, you've got all those beautiful... Uh, Art Deco buildings there. Now, luckily, it's become a conservation thing. So they can never change. That seafront can never change, which is there. And similarly, a time for the coming of Kambala Hill and Malabar Hill. So people are not aware that till then, Bombay finished at actually the university and the oval, and then was the sea. Okay? So if there's such a building frenzy, that means there's a lot of money in society. And it's indicative of there's going to be huge change in everything. Because the lifestyle is going to be very much like India, perhaps in the last 10 years of people wanting to go out, enjoy themselves, seek new ways of entertainment, recreation. Skating rinks were there uh, in Bombay. In fact, uh, Eros Cinema had a skating rink on one floor, which could take like 500 people at the same time. So in the midst of all this, uh, my mother's family uh, and very much Alec, Alec and my mother were brother and sister. The Padamsis, very affluent. Uh, people who had come up through really the glass business because that was a time when all this glass was coming in from Czechoslovakia and my grandmother's house, in fact, Kulsum Terrace that you've already mentioned, had windows with her etched initials on it, which are still there. So the skylights into the drawing room were all these KJP windows which had been done in Czechoslovakia in the early 30s. And of course, at the time, as everywhere uh, in India, the aspiration was that the child should get a very good English language education. My grandmother and my grandfather were just a generation away from moving from the village. They had moved from Talaja, from Saurashtra to Bombay themselves. And my grandmother was very, very ambitious in what she wanted her children to do. So at a very young age, when the children were just about three years old, they were put into a beautiful boarding school, very exclusive, not even 100 people in Bombay itself. Because every year she was... Um, having a child. Every 18 months, she was having a new child. So she had 14 children of whom eight survived. And because they had that kind of an input right at the little school they were in with uh, Irish uh, defrocked nuns teaching them, uh, they were prepared to go into the best of British residential schools. And here we're talking very early. We're talking about the 30s. So by 36, 37, my grandmother and grandfather packed their bags, bundled all these kids into a ship and taken them across the world to England. And actually, my grandmother didn't have great English skills. She taught herself the language. My grandfather had none. Um, and she just got a house very close to Sherwood, 
forest, so in Nottingham. And then she put the boys into one school, the girls into another school. And they got those few years of education abroad uh, before World War II broke out and they had to come back to India. But my eldest uncle, Sultan Padamsi, we all know as Bobby, uh, he was a trailblazer. He wrote very eloquently. Uh, he painted beautifully and he directed and acted. He had just that kind of voice and personality to uh, do a lot of things and charismatic in a way, perhaps, drew people to him by his kind of personality. I, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ask you to pause over there because yes. your father, uh, Ibrahim al Qadi, who's a legend yes. of Indian theatre, yeah. I remember described Sultan Padamsi as one of the great geniuses he had met. Absolutely. And, uh, within three years of, you know, of course, he, he passed away. Uh, it was very tragic. But the fact that a man could blaze his way into the state, so to say, and mm -hmm. keep such a huge impact is fabulous. But I'm gonna, uh, before I come to Sultan uh, Padamsi and the family, I'm going to ask you about theater itself. You know, uh, mm -hmm. for a long time, it was dominated by uh, a certain class of Parsi uh, theater. Absolutely. Theater, Absolutely. Theater. Yeah, it was yeah. Westernized, very, very uh, focused on Shakespeare and the whole world. Tell us about. What theater was like in, in, in Bombay? Because we know Calcutta was the first place where theater started. And of course, you had something uh, in different cities. But uh, Bombay had a very, very. Uh, big, and a lot of the early film producers are also Parsi merchants. Actually. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So, what we call Parsi theater is not really driven by the Parsis. And neither is it in Parsi Gujarati, it's largely in Hindustani. And um, came out of. Uh, Again, a search at that particular point of time, maybe uh, two or three decades earlier, of looking for live entertainment. You must realize also it's an age before cinema. Okay, so really in the 1890s in Bombay, about 50 years before what I'm talking about in the 40s, uh, there were 12 huge theaters built, each one seating between 1,200 to 2,000 people. So Bombay was dotted with these very large auditoriums. Okay. And they were all uh, in more or less one area, what we know as Grant Road today, and it's become a seamy part of town. But at that time, it wasn't that at all. And uh, it was also, we must realize that the Brits were very much here. So their own interest in amateur theatricals, whether in Bombay or Simla or Calcutta, a great interest in performing because their schools taught them the Sheridan and the Shakespeare. So they were doing those kind of plays. And Similarly, the Victorian melodrama had emerged as a big form, what we call Parsi Natak. So the Natak companies were huge traveling, uh, lots of players, musicians, and the forerunners perhaps of the Hindi movies, because they were long. They had a very dramatic story. There was a parallel plot with a comic kind of interviewed. Uh, there were songs and the songs became so popular as I've described in my book, one particular song at the theater that lasted the longest in Bombay called Bhangwari, because it, it was in the middle of the Bhang sellers of Bombay, okay, literally the opium sellers of Bombay, which was a big trade at that time. So they'd have a play where the actress would sing uh, the song and do 11 encores. So even if she was to die, uh, she wouldn't die till because people would throw money on the stage and say once more, once more. Oh so God. they actually had a scrim curtain coming down and money could only be thrown onto the stage in a velvet pouch, so it didn't hit her. Okay, you had to throw it on the floor of the stage. So you can imagine the floor of the stage covered with these velvet pouches. And this particular actress, uh, you know, singing this song for the 11th time before finally dying. So the theatre just would be alive and kicking. People would leave around 2 in the morning. And you can imagine all those beautiful Victoria carriages of that time which still exist in some parts of Bombay, are lined up like two or 300 of them waiting for people to leave. And it was such a big social event at the time that trains would come from Surat, trains would come from Ahmedabad uh, and people, if the train would be named the name of the play. So everybody in the train had bought tickets to see the play and they were all going together to see this particular play in Bombay, okay? So the draw that later the cinema had Certainly at that time, uh, the theater had. And this was just one major commercial tradition. Of course, there was also very much the much more social drama of the Marathi state, which was very active at that time. 
but uh, the Gujarati stage, the Urdu stage was very commercialized. And uh, already the kind of nationalist themes couched as uh, history or as mythology were already appearing on the stage in a big way. So often the same production opened in Calcutta to the Marwadi traders there who were all Hindi speaking and would move from Rajasthan. And then the same production would move to Bombay and they would look for uh, a local cast and just bring all the costumes, the sets and everything. And those were elaborate productions, you know, the one I saw, I remember when I was about 15, must be one of the last ones <clears throat> at Bhangwadi. It had those beautiful painted settings and wings. So you were in a forest, then you were in the palace, then you were in the heavens, mm -hmm. then you were uh, below the earth, okay? And every show had some spectacular effect. Something went up in flames or some people disappeared in front of your eyes. So during this huge production, a drop curtain would come down, very shallow, about six feet deep, and there'd be a very uh, lascivious, almost like a Lavani dancer would come and she'd have two husbands and there'd be a comic kind of interlude. As we sometimes see in Shakespeare plays, you know, and the whole set is being changed within minutes behind them. And then the drop curtain rises and you all gasp because, oh my God, it's a different scene. And on every seat in the auditorium was the songs of the play. And the lights would come up in the auditorium and the audience would take up their songbooks as though they were in a church and sing along uh, with the song yeah. that was happening on the stage. Yeah, it was a sing along tradition, yeah. So when the movies started, by the 40s, the movies had really come up in a big way. Then of course, this audience died. And many of these actors and actresses went into the movie industry. You know, uh, Faisal, what is interesting is, uh, you know, the, your, your story of the family starts at a very interesting time. It's the 40s, uh, World Wars happened, the families had to move back. It's also a time when the national movement is really uh, up steam. And there is a parallel theatre movement also in the form of the Indian people. It, uh, absolutely, it, yeah, yeah. Okay, also had a tremendous impact. Absolutely, theater, absolutely, theater. yeah, yeah. It went down to the grassroots and continued. So tell me, what was the role of Sultan Padamsi, Ibrahim al Qazi, and, and later people like Alex in this ferment? How did they see theatre and what is the change that they brought about. Okay, so I think what happened at that moment was because uh, my mother's family, the Padamsis, were very westernized and had had the best of a western kind of education. So their mind was still full of all those writers, you know what I mean? So they were growing, they had grown up with Shakespeare and I can tell you the whole Indian theatre community has grown up with, theater, with Shakespeare and even now every year at the National Theatre Festival uh, in Delhi, uh, the uh, Bharat Rang Mahotsa, there are at least five Shakespeare plays regularly. So there's always a Macbeth, there's always a King Lear, there's always one of the comedies. There's inevitably Midsummer Night's Dream. So we've taken very easily to Shakespeare long before Vishal Bharadwaj started his films. Okay. <laughs> and I think in that setting, what happened was really Sultan Padamsi, because he was forced to move out of St. Xavier's College, they found Oscar Wilde's Salome much too uh, sort of avant-garde and new and different in what it was trying to say and the way it was saying it. Uh, they were forced out of there and around this famous horseshoe-shaped table, they started their own group, all students at St. Xavier's. So my father was perhaps in first or second year. Uh, my uncle Hamid Sayani, who was a famous Born Beater quiz guy and Amin Binaka Geetmala's brother. Uh, my other uncle, who was very big in lighting, Derek Jeffries. Uh, Adi Marzban. Jean Bhavnagri, who later on was a big UNICEF guy, uh, UNESCO guy, and came back and started the whole new wave in filmmaking uh, with getting uh, MF Hussain to make films and Thayab Mehta to make films and all. So this was the young lot of people, young 17, 18, 19 year olds, okay? And they knew they were in the midst of and India in the complete throes of change because outside their doors, outside their windows were the huge 1942 movement, Quit India, uh, the burning of cloth. Uh, all those movements were right there. So they would regularly go, at least my father among them, would regularly go to hear Gandhiji or to hear other people. Jinnah was very much there in Bombay at that time, okay? So they were very aware of what was happening outside and they were very aware that they were not part of that crowd. You know what I mean? 
they could see that even Prithviraj Kapoor, which was again a, quite a westernized family at that point of time, and uh, Shakespeareana, uh, Jennifer, who married into this family, Shashi Kapoor, they were also now going to all the little Rajas and Raj Gharanas, uh, that kind of uh, network. So many things were happening simultaneously in theater. And of course, there was Ipta, which had just started at that time. And Ipta was doing a much more political kind of theater. So that whole progressive writers association that we link with Mantu and Ismat Chukta and all is all at the same time. So I think artists all over India were thinking we will soon be free, the British are going to go. And when we are free, who are we as Indians? Are we secondhand Westerners? Are we going to look back at our own roots? So I think through the theater group years, uh, even Bobby himself, even before he died at the age of 23, he was already planning one of the Gore's plays. My father was sent off to learn Kathakali to be a part of it. So they're already looking at roots. And then I think at the same time, because of all those artists who came up, the progressive artists group, you know, Souza and Bakre and Raza and Hussain, uh, already Indian artists were saying, we don't have to do this company style painting. We don't have to do this academic realism. Uh, we have to do something that is much more rooted in our own culture. We have to start looking at Khajuraho. We have to start looking at uh, mural traditions of Ajanta Elora. And similarly in dance, similarly in music. So everybody's beginning to look anew and afresh. And within 10 years, you have everybody at the same time. Ravi Shankar in one room, my father in the next room, Gaiton Day painting in the third room, you know, uh, the first theater bookshop and arts bookshop opening in the same Mulamai Desai complex. So there was a great synergy between the arts. Yeah, it was, it was really a time when all forms of art, the performing Absolutely. arts, and uh, the visual arts were coming together, and so was literature actually. Because was and cinema, and writing. cinema. But you know, uh, what I also find interesting after reading your book and really understanding that whole journey that your father took uh, to Delhi and uh, the National School of Drama, which is a whole new phase, is how the two branches kind of separate, you know, that generation of Jasinder Kuna, uh, Alex, they were, mm -hmm. Like Alex famously said, they were uh, ad men in the morning and theater guys in the evening. Absolutely. And yeah. They had this little, very, very elite, very, very, uh, you know, uh, a, a universe of their own, doing fabulous, mm -hmm. which continues to, to the day. You know, mm -hmm. the NCPA and uh, you know, they said, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is so but Ibrahim Al Kazi goes to Delhi, um, and of course, there's a huge interim because. Uh, the NSD woos him, he's, he's conceptualized the idea of NSD, and he goes and brings a whole new way. And mm. Delhi is completely taken by surprise because mm. what he does over there, while Bombay had a Gujarati and Marathi theater movement, Delhi mm. suddenly didn't. And what he had nothing. Is, it, was a, had it was a desert, absolutely. And brings together some fabulous productions together. Mm -hmm. And those, that, that phase is very interesting for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because okay. what made him want to expand and was it a very well thought out uh, change in direction? Yeah, but I think what happened was uh, soon after uh, Bobby died uh, in 46 and my parents and all, that, all the three sisters married various people all linked with the theatre completely. Uh, I think my father decided he had to have some professional training and he had a very enlightened father, my grandfather who was a businessman but encourage all his kids. So I have three uh, uncles and aunts who are major artists across the world. My father went off to England ready to study painting and art because he was very deft and good at it. Just the first year and a half at RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, but actually in libraries, reading and understanding and seeing on the stage, the ferment that was occurring in European theater at the time, not British so much, though that's a great age, you know, it's Laurence Olivier, Vivian Lee, still are big icons of acting. But he was able to see what was, understand from there what was happening in Russia, maybe 20 years earlier, which was very well documented. It was Stanislavski, uh, Meyerhold, what was happening in France at the same time. And also what was happening, for instance, in a place like Dartington Hall in England, you know, which is like the British equivalent of Shanti Niketan. It started by the guy who helped uh, Ravindranath Tagore set up uh, Shanti Niketan. And again, it's a confluence of the arts. 
So the dancers residing there, the visual artists, the theater people, all from all over the world. The people who've done the first major work on Asian art, dance, dance drama in Bali, are all at Dartington Hall and my father's in the midst of them. So you're in a very heterogeneous group of people and not just my father, because with my father, of course, went Nisim Ezekiel, uh, Francis Newton, Souza, they all stayed together. Very often they slept in the same bed and they wore the same clothes as you know, they wore each other's clothes. And my mother was there and Souza's first wife, Maria. So it is a very vibrant lot of Indians in a London devastated after World War II and looking at how England had opened up to the continent, to Europe, and what was happening in Europe, what was happening also uh, in American drama. Though my father had very little influence of American drama in him. In fact, he only did some American plays as the last productions he did uh, as, as a director. So he's very drawn to European uh, theatre. So when he came back to Bombay, because he'd now gone into it as a profession. So he was not ad man by day and uh, actor by the evening. Though many people, we must realize in India, the whole amateur theater movement is the theater movement. Yeah. So whether it's Dr. Sri Ram Lagu or Dr. Mohan Agashe, all the psychiatrists or people from various different disciplines, Shaman and Jalan who was something by day, something else by night. So when he came back, obviously he wanted that rigor there in the theater group that do it in this kind of a way, work on your voice, work on your stance, look at the period of the story, enact in that kind of way, look at different places to present. So he moved here to outdoors for the first time in Bombay with his production of Oedipus Rex, which was in a, in a lawn at the Boulevard Desa Institute. He did the first arena style staging in Bombay with uh, Ibsen's Ghosts. Uh, he used college auditoriums like for Hedda Gabler and he explored a lot of what was being written in Europe at the time. So actually one of the first productions of Waiting for Godot outside Europe is in Bombay in India with Jersin playing a formidable role in it. And it ran for 24 performances. It was not like a seven, eight play, you know, night run. And then he said, let's do it right here on our roof. So our rooftop was a theater and actually on the staircase going up, you would have Pupul Jaikar, you'd have Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, you'd have Girish, and Meghna, Girish Karnar and Meghna Desai, greatest friends in college. So it was a very vibrant kind of audience which was engaging in the arts in a very major kind of way and knowing that they had to make the difference. You know what I mean? So they were driven by that idea that we are making the difference. I think that's what encouraged uh, the Ministry of uh, Culture at the time to reach out to him and say, this man has the big vision. He's not specifically Bengali theatre, Marathi theatre, Gujarati theatre, English theatre. He will be able to. And my father said, hold on, I'm not ready. I'm very young. I'm 32. So give me three or four years. I'll start doing theatre camps across India. So he did in Almoda. He did in Simla. He did in Mathiran. He started doing plays in Hindi. So the first production of what is now an iconic Indian play, Antigone, which we all know and we've all seen and whether it's in Marathi with uh, Chitra Palikar and Dr. Nagu, or whether it's in uh, Bengali uh, with Shamanand himself acting in it, or whether it's in Hindi, where there have been so many productions, my Dube. Uh, so many things he did. And then he had to also just master the language, master Hindi before coming to the national capital. So when he came in 62, 63, uh, he was already looking around for what should he do? And he didn't want to do a Western play. He didn't want to do a fabulous King Lear or a fabulous Oedipus Rex. He wanted to start with plays. And unfortunately, Hindi drama, the kind of plays being written was still in an archaic textbook kind of Hindi. I think through his career at NSD, he looked more and more for that authentic voice, as I think I've quoted in the book. Actually, when you speak with your Mali, actually, when you speak with the Bai at your home, you know, we speak in so many different uh, versions of Hindi. So he looked for the writers and he found the biggest writers of the day had written plays. So Mohan Rakesh was already very well known, but nobody had done this Ashar Gaik then. Didn't happen on radio, but on the stage. So he said, let's do this. And there was no theater. He said, okay, the back courtyard of NSD, we will build this little UP village and we will do the play right here. 
And they were very young actors, 17, 18, 19, Sai Paranjpe, playing Priyangu Manjuri in that production. Om Shukpuri, who of course went then later into the film industry. Sudha Sipur, Shipuri, who finally played Sasvi Kabi Bahuti. She was the eldest of all those uh, grandmothers in the thing. Uh, so those early years, and then later, of course, Surekha Sikri, who we all know now by name, right up to Badhai, who's still acting, Uttara Baukar. So many people have come over the years. But I think just to say, there is an Indian voice. This is the Indian voice. Let's do it and let's promote it. So immediately after our shark eye, then everybody said, oh my God, here's an Indian playwright. Here's an Indian production. It's about Kalidas's life. You know, it's so riveting. It's so modern. Uh, it's captured something very real about UP village life. And then he followed it up with Andha Yog, which right. as you know, the first production was straight at Firosha Kutla. And that, of course, mm -hmm. was great interest to me personally, because yes. of the fact that it was at the Firosha Kutla, fabulous setting. And it was soon after the debacle uh, uh, India faced with China in the war. That's right. And Jawaharlal Nehru was there. It was a yes. very uh, loaded play at that point. Yes. Uh, yes. In, uh, when a nation yes. was... Uh, you know, uh, at such a weak uh, footing. But uh, it's very interesting that he, you know, what amazes me about Ibrahim Al-Kazi and uh, what has been written about and you have captured well, that he was, uh, and he was a man of many lives, which we will come mm -hmm. to not just later. But it was really the vast sweep of his talent. It was not mm -hmm. the fact that he trained the theater or the, or the artist, but also the setting, the, the newness of his thought, the scale of his ambition, etc. You know, um, what's the legacy of, of Andhadu, uh, or Andhayug, really, uh, in, in, in uh, theatre then? Well, I think uh, it's so important because it's a verse play. Mm -hmm. It's written in verse, the entire play. And that's, uh, of course, we always have sung texts from earlier. But to have a verse play that's very modern. And often when you see it, it appears like the world after nuclear winter. If we did it next year, we think this is a world after COVID. You know what I mean? So the relevance of that play, the devastation of the world by man on man, uh, uh, by the end of the play, the killing of Krishna in the forest because Gandhari curses him. And the curse is uh, that it will, be, it will be neither night nor day, it will neither be an animal, you'll be taken for an animal, though you are a god, you know what I mean? So the dimensions of so many of the thoughts and ideas that exist in Andhayu, and the central character there is a terrible character uh, of the court of Ashwatthama. So it's not a story of Arjun, Yudhishthir, Bhim, the good guys. It's the other side story. And I think that's what's so fascinating to us as theatre people, that it is about Dhritarashtra, Gandhari losing all the hundred sons, the death of Duryodhan, Sanjay and the court, and Ashwatthama very crucially. So it's depicting a very different world from how we see Indian myth. As perhaps within a few years of that, Girish Karnad did with the Yayati. The Yayati is again a very early story in the Mahabharat, but he reinterpreted it. And I think that reinterpretation of something from the past, as did Mohan Rakesh with the story around Kalidas's early life in Ashar Kaitin. So I know even later when my father did uh, Sultan Rasya Balvan Kargi's script, it was at a time where there was a lot of uh, debate about what is happening to Indira Gandhi in politics. You know what I mean? So it drew its own kind of parallel, not directly, as when they did, when NSD did uh, Tughlaq. Everybody saw it as the Nehruvian dilemma, okay? Was there on the stage. So to find that resonance between a script mm. and society, I think is so important. So that whole idea by the 70s, you see, uh, people stop doing uh, all those sex comedies in Bombay. So we don't have the Harrys and the Marys. We all grew up acting as Harry, Mary and Tommy and Anthony and, you know, trying to do these Brooklyn accents and all. It's gone. And then it was so interesting about 15 years ago, we were all at a seminar in Delhi and Lilith said, Dubey said, I am never doing a Western play again. I'm only going to pick up Indian scripts. And I said, Lilith, among your friends, I'm going to hold you to this one. And she stuck with it. And she has made a success. So you see many plays by Mahesh Dattani, Vijay Dulkar, all in English, running for hundreds of shows. Right. So to popularize 
uh, an Indian script in that way in English with a theater going audience. Hats off to her. And of course, a generation earlier to Alec, with doing Tughlaq and uh, Giddhari and uh, Gurcharan Das's Meera and many other scripts. One could argue that Shakespeare continued to be this, you know, the two great source pools for theater, for film. There's Shakespeare and there's the Mahabharat. You know, That's right. There are these two pillars uh, around yeah, yeah. which so many stories have evolved. But Kalidas is a fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we are doing a, a whole series on Kalidas's works, and mm -hmm. he was a historian. He was a contemporary, uh, you know, uh, uh, chronicler. He was many, many things. We have he was a an environmentalist to what extent? Many, many things. I mean, you read the Meghdutam, and you you can understand mm -hmm. the scale of what the man did. Not enough has been done. Do you think this is still a work in progress that a lot more needs to be done on regional literature because we don't see enough of it? Or is it being done and we don't see? Well, I think in theater, what happens is, I mean, from my father's experience and, and pushing, I think what happened in the NSD by 64, 65, within a year or two of him being there, every play in a regional language, even before it was produced regionally, was translated into Hindi. So we should never forget that Tughlaq is a Kannada play. Sure. That Baki Tihas and, and Badal Sarkar's plays are all Bengali plays. You know what I mean? We all think, oh, Khamosh Adalat Zari hai. So we think, oh, it's a Hindi play. It's not really a uh, Hindi play. So to be able to translate the work and then give it a national level performance, immediately push drama to the forefront and perhaps uh, literature, uh, poetry, uh, novels, the translations came much later. But the fact that in theatre it happened immediately and immediately had an audience. And then you felt, oh my God, here's a Kannada writer writing in Kannada, translated into Urdu, being performed in Delhi against this setting where perhaps Muhammad bin Tughlaq stayed uh, or lived or may have been in that environment in some kind of a way. You never think for a minute, you feel, oh my God, this is totally an Indian play. So to go beyond the Kannada play, the Tamil play, you know what I mean? The Gujarati play, the Marathi play, but to see them as national themes, as perhaps a generation later, Mahesh El Kunchwa did so beautifully in his Vada Chere Bandi, which uh, though set in a village in Maharashtra, uh, you do it any part of India and it's a story of that changing rural uh, family, uh, you know, going to the throes of what we call semi-urban and then urbanization, you know? So I think theater, because it's live, it's in a real time and space, it's engaging with an audience, uh, I think straight away, uh, that effort of reading, how often would we pick up a novel translated from another language? And we are foolish because all of us have grown up on all the Russian classics translated into English. But I think that translation and great translations, we still don't have a great translation of Prem Chan. I drew that. And I came to Tagore's poetry because he himself translated in an archaic way because he was in that period. But when I read, read William Radice's translation, I said, oh my God, this is what Tagore is. You know what I mean? So I'm going to ask you, you know, I, I remember writing uh, uh, my book and covering uh, you know, uh, post-liberalization in India and businesses. And I was uh, one of the uh, people I was focusing on was Ronnie Skuwala, who actually made that shift. And I point mm -hmm. out in the book, shift from South Bombay to uh, Juhu or uh, the film studios was a very long drive nobody had taken, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, NFT did act as a bridge because such a lot of powerful talent came out of there. Mm -hmm. This was seen as two worlds. And then you had the parallel cinema mm -hmm. universe. Um, and I'm very happy to say it sits on our board. You know, and such fabulous work he did. But there were these parallel lines. You know, those mm -hmm. lines rarely met. They were mm -hmm. crazy, there was universe, but they all kind of dominated their own space. And theater mm -hmm. was a very different space to all of this. Mm -hmm. Why do you think those differences were? Was it the sensibilities were different? The economics was different? <coughs> I think that's it. I think the economics were very different. And I think the eco uh, economics of the commercial, for instance, Gujarati stage, uh, are very different even today. You know, and they use, therefore you see in Gujarati, in Bombay Hindi theater, and in Marathi theater, it's largely run on the steam of lesser known TV stars. Okay, they're the vehicles to push the plays. You're seeing this actress who otherwise you're seeing on TV in an Ekta Kapoor kind of serial. Okay, or sometimes the plays that my cousin does in Bombay, Raya does. So you're going to see because it's Mona who's acting in the play. Okay, 
or it's Ronit Roy who's acting in the play, uh, or it's somebody from the uh, TV industry uh, who also has uh, one kind of step in theatre, whether you know, even I think Saurabh's play is such a good example, Saurabh Shukla's, and then he's got these three TV actresses with him, uh, two to tango, three to whatever, I don't know, forgot the title of the play, which is a Neil Simon play adapted to Bombay. Uh, then I think what happened was when professionally trained actors and my father made the step also then of combining with Film Institute. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting for me because at the time where my father-in-law was heading that part of Film Institute, the TV part of it. So that's really how these two families also met. And the first batch is all Nasir, Ompuri, and soon after that, Roini Hatangari and all. And then you see the change, Mahesh Bhatt Saranj with Anupam and Rohini. Uh, you see the first big serial, Bunyad, with Alok Nath and Anita Kavar coming out of NSD. You know what I mean? Leading the cast in that way. Sham, all the early films. Govind Neelani, all the early films. You can't see Govind Neelani film without seeing Om Puri or Nasir or both together in the film. Okay. And you can't see Sham Benegal's film without seeing a Girish Karnad or a uh, Absolutely. Or Smita yeah, or so so many people coming out of a theater movement as trained professional actors able to do a diverse thing. So that whole idea of a star, and there were so many reigning at that point of time, you know what I mean? Changing into an actor. So we never think of Om Puri as a star. Om Puri went, everybody said, oh, look at this man with the pockmark face, you know? How will he ever become a film star? not knowing that he was going to become a huge international star. Or even decades later, Irfan, I think is a very good example of somebody emerging from NSD. Or so many of the people acting in the series, Mirzapur today, are all NSD actors. Or yeah. even when Amir Khan did Lagan and Sheikha did Bandit Queen, it's just full of NSD people, Seema Biswas, and so many people who came from that kind of training and rigor, how to create a character on stage. Okay, so it's a big loss, maybe in a way. Some of them have straddled both the worlds, like Nasir has done so successfully. But many, like Ompuri, had to give up the stage, which he really regretted. He told me very often, Oh God, I wish I could just go back to being on the stage with a live audience rather than only doing cinema. So I think that was the shift that occurred in filmmaking. And uh, my father was also the head of the National Awards jury in the year where Ghatta Shraddha, Girish Kasaravadi's film, or uh, Vamsha Vriksha, one of the first films coming from the Karnad uh, stable, not him, but the other Karans. Uh, and it's interesting how in the late 70s and 80s, the influence maybe of the NSD training, the professionalism of the actor, uh, actors from all languages able to act in Hindi. Yeah. That was also a big change, isn't it? Rohini is not a native uh, Hindi speaker. She's Maharashtrian, you know? Uh, so everybody acting in Hindi and performing in Hindi and being able to make a mark despite not having the great looks. So in many senses, I'm gonna ask you, what is, the, what is the role of theater when the medium has changed so rapidly and uh, the, what made theater unique? Uh, the, the early contemporary, uh, you know, chronicler, narrator, et cetera, has also been appropriated with yeah. television formats. You know, in Mirzapur, you spoke about that yeah. example of that. So how do you see the role of theater today? Well, I think theater always remains at the forefront yeah. because as I see theater, theater is a mirror to society. All you're saying as a director or writer is, this has happened to me, has it happened to you too? That's the only question we ask an audience, you know? Because we know whatever has happened to us is somewhere a universal Indian experience. So theater is able to go into all, all those very dark. If you look at Mahesh Kuntwar's early plays, they're so dark. They deal with incest. They deal with anti-Brahmanism. They deal with that horrendous Dalit character in Kanyadan. You know what I mean? They deal with the parallel life of the rich lady and the poor lady in the other story, which they made into the film, then I think Shaban and Deepthi or somebody, I'm forgetting the name of the play. So uh, theater is able to go and because it's a live medium and the investment is not huge, cinema, the bottom line is always, will we get the returns? Okay, 
So theater is always cutting edge everywhere in the world. It's not something particular to India. You go to London, you see a play and you're one among 17, 18 people in an auditorium. Okay, you're thinking, oh my God, how do they run this? You know, with 17, 18 people, but it's dynamic. It's brilliant what is being done. So similarly in India, you know, if, you, if you're a theater person, you're not going to go and sit in the Tata uh, Auditorium Main Hall. You're not going to go to so St. Joseph's in Andrew. You're going to go to the Shriram Center. You're going to go in Delhi to a small space called Oddbird. You're going to go to Prithvi or those various other small hundred or less than hundred plus auditoriums. And there you're going to see something that you feel, okay, this is the theater movement. Right. So though I know Bombay every weekend, there's 60 plays. I've written a lot about this every weekend. And very often the same actor is doing a matinee of one play, evening of another, and the same thing on the Sunday. But so many of them are commercially driven vehicles. <clears throat> but as theater people, we accept that that is theater. Yeah. Uh, but is it art? Right. Okay. So, so we are more towards art. We say we are the artist. <laughs> There were two questions, really, two last questions. You know, what I also found amazing uh, with, uh, uh, you know, learning about your father and uh, listening to some of his interviews, the ambition of the man. He, yes. he was very clearly creating institutions. And mm -hmm. what I loved most about him was his ability to walk out and create something mm -hmm. totally different. So that's mm -hmm. confidence, right? When you're mm -hmm. not latching, latching onto your legacy and you, you've moved on mm -hmm. and he did that. And he also became a great uh, supporter of modern artists. But Homi Baba, uh, Ibrahim Al Qazi, all these people were institution builders. Do you see mm -hmm. institution builders today? Uh, in some sense, I don't, I don't know uh, whether they are these starring personalities or has have the times changed. I think the times have changed. I think it was so interesting after that passed away. I think M K Raina's comment was so telling. He said, "47 years after this man has left NSD." In public imagination, NSD is Ibrahim Al Qazi. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's almost 50 years ago. He left in the 70s. We're in 2020 and 21 now. You know? So I think lasting legacies, like you've said, of Humi Baba and what he's done, or towering personalities in music, nobody can forget the legacy of a Ravi Shankar or an Ali Akbar Khan. So now we'll say, oh, this is. So, you know, Zakir Hussain is related to that family in this way. So it's, uh, I think that whole personality of those people, whether a Prithvi Raj Kapoor in the theater world and in cinema as well, or a Raj Kapoor, though we have the next generation and the next generation into the arts, but I think the ability to forge and build an institution and perhaps also, I don't know, maybe the age of the charismatic personality has gone. I think there's a very telling comment that Jerson makes in the book, in one of the interviews I've used. He said, uh, Bobby was a towering uh, celebrity in Bombay at a time where there weren't so many celebrities. Now, every day, what is your measure of being a celebrity? Are you on page three? Is Kangana not making it to page three? Okay, so it's not of your intellectual... Social huh? media is only worse a bit, right? Uh, <laughs> I think it's never your intellectual capability. It's your ability to stay in the public eye. Absolutely. Okay. And not everybody's interested. Quite frankly, even among my ilk of theater people, and I know so many people in the film industry, they're not interested in being in the public eye all the time. They want uh, to do their own thing. Okay. And if they have an exposure, if, if it comes into that, well and good. If it doesn't, it really, it's no skin off their back. So I agree with you. There's no real outstanding institution today. Right. Last question, President. We are asking this of everyone because we're getting people from different walks uh, to talk about uh, in, important phases in India's history, the making of India and the making of Indian theatre. What would your top three, four milestones, turning points, you think, uh, in the theatre movement, in, in uh, which have left lasting legacies? Well, I think certainly 1942-43, where it's Ipta Theatre Group and uh, Utpal Dutt in Calcutta, simultaneously and Prithvi Raj Kapoor. I think just that is a very important turning point because everything turns. And I think what turns most importantly is the script changes. The actual text we're using, we throw out the old scripts and we're dealing with new content. 
That I think is very important in the theater movement. Similarly, my dad doing just those two plays, the Ashar Ka Ek Den and the Andha Yug in 62, 63 is again a big turning point for Indian theater because again, the script has changed. You know what I mean? Actually, what is in the actor's hand and he's uh, transacting with the audience in a way, that's completely changed. Then for me, a big turning point, uh, and I've done this strange combination in the 80s of I've taken Saftar Hashmi and I've taken Alec Padamsi, the other end of the spectrum, and I've taken Mahesh Elkunchwar. And I said, they're all very important because they're changing the audience. So Saftar is taking theater out of Sri Ram Center and other places into the street. Alec is defining a whole new audience with the rock operas, with Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, it was a phenomenon in its time, you know? We can't even understand what it was like. For the Catholics of Bombay, it was like an unbelievable near religious experience for them to see that, okay? And similarly, Mahesh, what he did and changed the whole tenor of playwriting uh, in Marathi, certainly, and because he was translated uh, all over India. So I'd say these are the big turning points that we've had. And what I see now as a turning point and problematic in its own way is uh, money has entered, okay? So whether we have uh, Meta or whether we have Adhyam or whether we have the many, many literature festivals funded by newspapers of various sorts, I think straight away what's tended to happen is people are doing a safer script. Yeah. People are choosing to do a Western play very often adapted to India, okay? But it's got to run and it's got to run in seven cities. So it's not only to run in Mumbai, Calcutta and Bombay, it has to go to Bangalore, it has to go to Chennai, it has to go to Hyderabad and wherever else they're going to run the festival. So it's not a dumbing down, but you see that people are going for very safe choices. Formula driven, okay. choices, I would say. Yeah. It's commercially driven. Yeah, it so becomes a commercially driven enterprise, okay? And I think that's problematic because so many top-notch directors in English and in Hindi and in Bombay and in Delhi uh, have gone, then you go in with that kind of thinking. You know what I mean? You go into it thinking, oh, I've got to get a play to one of these festivals and the play's got to be Indian, in quotations, whether I use a Shadi Ke Gaane or whether I resurrect some folk form from Konkani and it has to run, okay? So I've got to make sure that I present it, I have the budget to do that kind of a setting, all those kind of things. But perhaps that's not being true to who that person is themselves. Because they've done formidable work. Many of these people have done formidable work, cutting edge kind of work. But once you step into the arena of sponsorship, finally he who pays the piper calls the tune. <laughs> but is there also a failure of theatre not creating a universe that could help it stand on its own feet? You go to any small town in England, for instance, they have a theater that has a play every evening, every second evening, and the local community supports it. So is it, in a sense, that something that hasn't been worked on in now? I think, you know, we also tend to ignore the whole folk theater tradition. So whether it's Therakutu with its huge audiences in Tamil Nadu, or whether it's a Ramila, which still draws three lakh people every year on the other bank from Varanasi over there, Okay, so culture has a resonance to where it belongs. Okay, so we see the urban theater on a stage in a proscenium or in a studio space as being theater, but all the rest of it is also theater, sure. in my view. So actually, I think Sudhanba came up with this fantastic thing. He said every day, at least five lakh Indians are participating in a theater activity. They're making masks, they're making costumes, they're rehearsing, they're doing a dance something, they're getting ready for a religious festival or they're in the big cities. So it's a different, it's a different, uh, what should I say, a different geography in a way. I also think anywhere in the world, uh, the commercial industry, as we go abroad and we know that this dreadful mousetrap and phantom and everything have been on for years and years and years. But we know that is not what the theater of today is about. So we look out for Trafalgar Studios. We make a point to go to Royal Court, uh, in America, we'll go to the more loft spaces, the unusual spaces, to see the cutting edge theater. So I think the commercial industry will always be there in a big way. 
And we may not have the community theater of England, but we have the folk form and the sure. participation of the village. So let's see how things uh, turn out. And thanks, Ben. Yeah. You're welcome. Conversation to take us through the history of theater literally and the turning points. Many thanks for the day. Thank you.